it's 120. Let's begin. Um, hello, welcome everyone. I hope you are all enjoying this really cool symposium. I've heard some really great papers and I am looking forward to hearing a bunch more. Um, so let me introduce myself. My name is Vivian Zuluaga Pap, and I am a doctoral lecturer here at City Tech. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Each speaker will have 10 minutes to present. And when your time's almost up, I'll message you that you have one minute left. Um, all four of our presenters, once they're finished, will have hopefully about 10 minutes for Q&A. Um, feel free to post your questions in the Q&A during the talk. And feel free, everybody who's um, joining us, to participate in the chat, um, because we've been having some really interesting conversations in the chat. Um, so I'd like to introduce our panelists for today, um, and then we'll get started. So our first panelist is Josie Garza Medina, a PhD student working out of Texas Tech. And our second one will be Kimberly Jeanette, a PhD student. Oh, I missed my set up. Excuse me. I'm just going to say your guys' names. Kimberly Jeanette, Jennerette, uh, Jess Tucker, and Hale Lamb. Um, we're going to start with Josie. I am so sorry for that. I actually typed this up and it's all wrong. So feel free to correct me whenever. Oh. So Josie, are you ready to talk to us about gender performance and nascent dystopia in CD Project Red Cyberpunk 2077? Did I get that right? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, allow me to screen share. My name's Josie Garza Medina. I am a graduate teaching assistant at Texas A&M University Kingsville. My pronouns are she, her. Let me adjust these slides real quick. And my presentation today is on gender performance and NASA dystopia in CD Projekt Red's 2022 video game, Cyberpunk 2077. My belief is that cyberpunk is perhaps the definitive genre of the SF near future defined by body modification, wealth inequality, violence and crime, and room for experimentation with one's sexual identity and gender expression. One can read cyberpunk literature from the perspective of gender studies as an extrapolation of specific gender issues in the future now that we live in to their possible state in the near future. While cyberpunk and both its literature and world offers a liminal zone for gender experimentation and play, the fact that it is a capitalist and technological dystopia ends up reconstructuring the old structures of biopower that existed in the pre-cyberpunk world into a neo-Machiavellian system that encourages sexual and gendered exploitation and toxic masculinity. My presentation will focus on two specific cyberpunk texts that express the possibilities and limitations of these worlds. William Gibson's uh, definitive cyberpunk novel, Neuromancer from 1984 and CD Projekt Red's video game, Cyberpunk 2077 from 2020. Neuromancer tells us the story of Case, who is a hacker and a cis hetero white male in a near future cyberpunk world where the internet and technology are every day and hyper powerful. Case is recruited by a mercenary named Molly to hack into Wintermute and Neuromancer, two twin AIs that plan to join forces and control the entire matrix of the internet. Though Case has a longtime girlfriend, Linda Lee, at the beginning of the novel, she is depicted as a passive accessory to Case, and when she is murdered, her character is essentially forgotten while Case continues his life through a romantic and sexual relationship with Molly. Molly is techno-sexualized with her mirror-shade eye implants and her leather guard, very much in the vein of Trinity from the Matrix films. She, though she is straight, there is a bit of a queer-baiting element to her aesthetic. She almost entirely lacks agency outside of her depiction as a mercenary, and many times her body is seen as the subject of Case's titillation. The novel really 
falls flat on its face in exploring the feminist possibilities of cyberpunk technology, there is one scene that hints at the subversive potentiality of cyberpunk tech, but once again, it uh, ends up sexualizing and fetishizing rather than subverting our gender norms. I'm going to read a few of the quotes from that scene where Case uses a AI, uh, not AI, um, what a nervous system implant to access Molly's uh, sensations, the sensation of being in her body. Quote, the abrupt jolt, it's other flesh, matrix gone, a wave of sound and color. She was moving through a crowded street. For a few frightened seconds, he fought helplessly to control her body. How you doing, Case? He heard the word and felt her form, that, form then. She slid a hand into her jacket, a fingertip circling a nipple under warm skin. The sensation made him catch his breath. She laughed, but the link was one way. He had no way to reply. Later on, on this particular section, uh, Case has questions about what he truly knows about Molly, what it, who the mind is that he shares these sensations with, and rather than the questions that he asks being about her gender and how it uh, situates her within her cyberpunk world, his questions ultimately go back to the way that she interacts with him during sex. Now, a lot has changed since Neuromancer came out in 1984. There's been vast improvements in the depictions of gender in cyberpunk literature. And uh, in 2020, CD Projekt Red released a video game adaptation of the tabletop role-playing game Cyberpunk by R. Tausorian Games. It promised a gender-inclusive take on the Gibson aesthetic for the modern-day era of increasing legal rights and visibility for queer and trans people. I have listed some of the options that were included in the game, like a bisexual lead character, same-sex romance options, queer and trans NPCs. However, the game was a disaster on launch. It released in an unfinished state. This led to such events as a class action lawsuit by gamers and the removal of the game from the PlayStation Store. Despite this initial turmoil, Cyberpunk 70, 2077 has been patched into a quality product. Its core narrative and insights into gender and sexuality in the near future of our cyberpunk dystopia are fascinating and disturbing in their implications. V, the main character of Cyberpunk 2077, can come from three possible origin stories. Corpo, a corporate fixer, street kid, a street mercenary, or nomad, a member of a biker gang. In all three of these origin stories, the main narrative is that when V is forced to plug a chip called the Relic into their head after a gig gone wrong, they survive with the help of the Relic. However, the relic is encoding the consciousness of the long-missing hacktivist and rock star Johnny Hill Silverhand onto their brain. V and Silverhand must attempt to remove the relic from their brain and save their life while taking revenge on Arasaka, the corporation that imprisoned Silverhand's consciousness in the relic. And over there in that photo, you have me as V, that's one of the wonderful things about this game is that due to the character customization mode, you can experiment with your own gender expression through the character creation. Night City, the location of the game, is a cyberpunk dystopia. There is extreme wealth disparity, rampant gun violence and crime, including attacks by cyber psychos, military veterans with prosthetic-induced PTSD who go on shooting sprees. Uh, there's lots of gang warfare and homelessness. There is essentially no official networks of care, and toxic masculinity and the exploitation of women and children can be found everywhere in the city. Despite the promises of a better life that the cyberpunk future offered V and their fellow residents, 
of Night City 2077 is just 2023 with 54 additional years of innovation and inequality. There is no more nuclear family. Found families must practice self-care within decentralized networks of support amidst the libertarian nightmare of decadence and libertinism. Though body modification and the anonymity of the city allow for increased acceptance of alternative genders and sexualities, this comes at a financial cost. Many times pre-cyberpunk gender relations and biopower still exist with alterations for the new era of new flesh. Uh, many times, Cyberpunk 27 extrapolates banal horrors of the present day, such as mass shootings, social isolation, and job insecurity into a near future dystopia that is becoming more and more likely. Its combined perspective of futurology and gender studies is similar to that of both Emile Zola's realist epic Le Rougon de Court and Friedrich Engel's gender anthropology text, The Origin of the Family, Private Property, and the State. Like how Engels used then current research in anthropology to discover the origin of gender relations in his 1800s, cyberpunk literature can be read as extrapolating the gender now into a fictional representation of the gendered future. While Neuromancer fails many of our current standards of diversity, it is important as a foundational text, and while Cyberpunk 2077 was derided at launch for its flaws, it is a diamond in the rough in its critiques of gender and power, biopower in the cyberpunk world. And here is my work cited. Uh, I hope you enjoyed my presentation, and I look forward to questions. Thank you, Josie. Um, amazing, incredible. So next we have. Kimberly Jenneret, um, take it away. Hi, yeah. Um, hopefully I'm coming through clearly. Let me see here. <clears throat> okay, is that coming through clearly for everyone? Oh. Hello? Yep. Okay, good. So <clears throat> I'll uh, go ahead and get rolling then. Uh, hi, I'm Kimberly Jenneret. Um, I am a PhD student working out of Texas Tech. Um, and I apologize for any background noise. The fan in my laptop is broken recently. So I'm dealing with that if you hear any kind of grinding. But um, I'll be presenting on the game series Mass Effect and specifically the embodied sexuality present within the relationship options uh, therein and the queer relationship op relationship options specifically. Um, so to get into it, I want to kind of specifically ask the question of why Mass Effect? What does Mass Effect offer specifically for this conversation that allows us to kind of reflect and consider the way and uh, scope of queer relationality uh, in gaming? Uh, the first is a broad sense of digital embodiment, this idea of being able to place yourself in the position of a uh, queer relationality and build that relationship uh, through an identity you create within the game. Next, uh, I will be talking about queer narrative and representation, what Mass Effect offers for those specific uh, concepts. And then what does Mass Effect itself provide for reflecting on queer relationships? Um, so just to get into uh, the digital embodiment uh, specifically, <clears throat> um, I want to start by with a little caveat saying there's a lot of literature and theory on the way in which digital embodiment and um, identity creation in digital spaces functions. I don't have time to get into the full scope of that theory, but I want to I want to provide a few kind of specific uh, points that are gen that are often generally agreed upon uh, across uh, texts. The first. <clears throat> Embodiment uh, in a digital space is significant, but not all encompassing. It's often a rhetorical kind of, uh, a rhetorical trap to sort of argue along lines of how much does digital embodiment um, subsume or contest a physical embodied uh, identity? Um, it should be considered, it's more useful to consider it along the lines of reflecting back upon <laughs> and extending a physical identity rather than competing with. Uh, next, that the scope of embodiment is limited by what is allowed within the platform, 
broadly, this, this is referring to the way in which a digital identity is limited by what the developers of a given platform agree uh, that or believe that is an allowable identity. What is able to be created within the concept of that platform, of that world. And we'll see, we'll explore that a bit with Mass Effect specifically going forward. And then the final point I wanna get on is the way identities reflect back on personal uh, perceptions of the self. And that's going to be kind of the main crux of what Mass Effect offers for the ability to reflect on queer relationality and queer relationships and narratives uh, going forward. On that note, <clears throat> in queer for the queer narrative and representation, I don't want I want to start with another caveat in this point that I don't want Mass Effect to come across to seem as though it is it is something that's not because it's very much positioned as a mainstream uh, uh, blockbuster kind of franchise, which uh, which necessarily limits a lot of the um, otherwise ambitious goals it might have for queer representation. So the scope of queer representation in gaming is very vast, and we see a lot of good work done by creators like Anna Anthropy and uh, other developers who are creating more independence uh, or genuinely genuine queer perspectives. Um, but Mass Effect still offers a lot of discussion in this uh, area. And I want to kind of frame that discussion through the notion of a particular question within the universe created by Mass Effect. What does a queer identity? And this is the question I'll be using uh, to frame the analysis um, going forward. But one final point I want to kind of uh, hit on is this point of what is this actually providing for reflecting on queer relationships? And I think there's three key um, ideas that are uh, at stake and at present in this conversation. The first is that Mass Effect just provides mainstream queer representation in the first place. And particularly, it provides that representation um, being placed <coughs> at an equal level to it, to heterosexual relationship options. Uh, they are just as deeply developed and just as, um, as accessible as the uh, heterosexual ones. And so there's, there's a sense of equality in how these relationships are valued and seen as valid. Uh, next, uh, there is the sense of explicit queer sexuality as an extension of that persistent romantic relationship. Sex and sexuality are not um, unique to Mass Effect. Or unique, um, we have seen gaming with a sex and sexuality in it before, but something unique, uh, something prominent in Mass Effect is the way that sexuality um, <clears throat> extends from romantic, so that uh, queer uh, representations and queer narrative uh, can move beyond uh, courtship and admiration into a very physically embodied representation of queer uh, presentation. Um, and then the final points to hit on is, a, is something of a unique aspect of Mass Effect itself, is that it presents relationship choices that can be explored that are persistent throughout the course of the series. It's, an it's a series with three installments of games, and the choices made in previous games impact the ways relationships move forward in uh, subsequent games which is something that, that uh, broadly is, is uh, very, very uh, unique about Mass Effect at the scale it offers its relationships, um, but also that naturally reflects back on the scope of queer relationships uh, within the series. Um, so with that kind of groundwork established, I'd like to kind of just get into the general numbers and evaluate what is at stake in Mass Effect specific. First, um, to get into the numerics broadly uh, for relationship uh, options of potential partners. The first game offers three potential partners, nine in the second game, and then 15 in the third game. And to contextualize these numbers a little bit, the second, the context of the second game is largely an aim at discomforting <clears throat> the player with significant changes to the status quo, while the third game can largely be seen as more of a celebration of the re interpersonal relationships built up over the previous two. Um, in the transition from the first to the second game, three characters cross over from the original crew into the uh, new crew. Um, one of them is not available for a romantic relation relationship, and the other two are available as heterosexual encounters. And then the third game prevents, presents the first explicitly gay and lesbian partner options, where 
Uh, they're only accessible as romantic partners by members of by player characters of the same sex rather than being available to both sexed options. Uh, then uh, to get more into these numbers, I want to break these down by uh, species itself. So thinking through uh, Mass Effect provides a sense uh, a, a world in which humans and aliens are interacting. So I wanted to kind of analyze how this how this di divide falls between human and alien. Uh, <coughs> In the first game, there are two human options, which are both the heterosexual option, where and a one uh, alien option with Liara and Asari, uh, who is able to be romanced by both genders of Shepard. The second game introduces the first queer human character with uh, Kelly Chambers, and the third game brings back almost all previous relationship options while introducing five new members uh, to the cast: four humans and uh, one alien. And those two uh, specifically gay and lesbian characters mentioned earlier are among the new humans introduced. And then finally, I want to break down this discussion by uh, orientation uh, specifically. Um, yes. <clears throat> uh, in uh, Mass Effect 1, Liara is from a monogendered species as the queer romance option. Uh, Two more Asari characters in Mass Effect 2, and um, Kelly as the potential human career partner, and then three introduces those first two, those first uh, gay and lesbian specific characters, as well as uh, expanding on Caden, a character from the first game, to be from male to, uh, from a heterosexual encounter to a bisexual encounter, able to be romanced by a male character. Uh, and I'll speed through kind of the conclusion because I am running out of time here. So, um, some of the things that we see this series doing over the course of its uh, installments, it expands the context and complexity of queer narratives and player engagement in those narratives. And specifically, it facilitates a way in which a, a player can engage with queer relationality um, in a way that slowly incorporates that more into a human perspective, starting at something that is very alien and moving into something that's very human. And we see that most in uh, the Caden scenario where you start with this heterosexual scenario um, that, if you're playing as a male character, can only start as a friendship, and then grows into one in which you are able to express homoromantic and homoerotic feelings for one another. Um, and I will wrap up there in the interest of time. Thank you, and I look forward to any follow-up questions, or you can reach me at my email or my Twitter account. Um, I also have some suggested readings to contextualize additional information. Uh, with the QR code on the screen uh, here. Uh, but thank you for your time. Thank you, Kimberly. That was really fascinating. Um, so next we have Jessica Tucker. Go ahead. You just have to unmute yourself, please, Jessica. Thank you. Sorry about that. I'm having a bit of technical difficulties. Okay, so that should bring us to the beginning here. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to be talking about From Red Sonia to Red Sonia, the sexualization of a fantasy feminist. My name is Jess Tucker, and I am the university archivist at the University of North Texas. I am also a guest, a panelist, an artist on the regional science fiction and fantasy convention circuit. For those of you who don't know very much about UNT, we are a tier one research university with a strong reputation for the arts, including music, visual, and literary. We also have a small but rapidly growing collection of speculative fiction, archival holdings. Uh, we have some really amazing things and I could talk for a really long time about that, but for the purposes of this presentation, the most relevant things are our Robert E. Howard studies and fanzines and the papers of fantasy cover illustrator Victoria Poiser Lisi. And also, I apologize, I apparently have a co presenter today, my cat Chloe. Okay. Um, unfortunately, in such a short presentation, we don't have a lot of time to talk about our great archival holdings. Obviously, I'm biased, I love them. 
Um, but I will be uploading this presentation. So if you wanna take a look at some more of these things at your leisure, and of course, I will include my contact information if you have any research questions. But let's get to Sonia. This is what you got the ticket for. All right, so the Red Sonia of Rogatino first showed up in 1934 in the story, The Shadow of the Vulture by fantasy author, Robert E. Howard. Now, for those of you who don't know Robert E. Howard, he was a fantasy author from Cross Plains, Texas. He's most famous for the creation of the character Conan the Barbarian. Uh, he wrote a little fantasy, a little horror, uh, a little historical fiction. He wrote a lot of things for the pulps of the time. Uh, you'll see a lot of his work in Weird Tales. Howard was a little different from many of the other authors of the time in that he did actually have some pretty prominent female characters. In addition to Sonia, there was Valeria, Bellet, Agnes de Castellon. Opinions are very, very mixed on these characters, though. Um, they've been labeled as anti-feminist, proto-feminist, and pretty much everything in between. Now, to be clear, Shadow of the Vulture is a very much historical fiction. No connection to Conan. Red Sonia Rogatino is written by Howard can be defined as strong, independent, distinctly feminist, and without any apparent romantic or sexual inclination. And as we can see from the artist's conception here, she is described as very definitely beautiful. Howard does not spare the descriptive words, but always very practical in both dress and weapon. She's got shirt, she's got trousers, she's got boots, she's got pistols, she's got a saber. She is ready for battle. Sonia does very harshly criticize other women that she sees as weak or dependent, including, or maybe especially her own sister, Roxolana. Now from 1934 to 1973, we have a big Sonia silence. We don't hear anything. Sonia burst back onto the scene in 1973. And by the way, happy 50th, Sonia. Sonia was reintroduced to the world by Marvel Comics, Roy Thomas, uh, Roy Thomas is perhaps better known as being the first successor editor-in-chief to Stan Lee. He introduced Sonia specifically as a female counterpart to their more popular character, Conan the Barbarian. Now, this is not Sonia of Rogatino. This is a very different sort of character. First of all, this Sonia is in the Hyborian Age. That means she's firmly in the realm of fantasy, not historical fiction. Her name gets a J, more exotic, loses the I. One of the most important things is she has a very gruesome new backstory. Mercenaries have murdered her family and raped her. In the aftermath of this horrible event, she is visited by the Red Goddess, who gives her the ability, gives her superhuman abilities in battle in exchange for a vow not to sleep with any man who cannot defeat her in battle. And even though in the very first issue, we see Sonia with actually a chainmail shirt and unfortunately hot pants, she really is the ground zero for the woman warrior in chainmail bikini trope. We've seen woman warriors before, we've seen chainmail bikinis before, but Sonia is really one of the first to bring those two together. So where did that chainmail bikini come from? Well, to answer that question, let's take a look back at the fantasy art of women in the 1970s. So definitely, definitely, we can see some similar characters. We can see a lot of non-functional bikinis, a lot of metal outerwear, very, very similar to how Sonia looks. Sonia's look specifically came from an uncommissioned illustration that was sent to Roy Thomas by Spanish author Esteban Moroto. And we can see one of Moroto's other images here in The Lady of the Wolves. Uh, can I interrupt for one second? Jessica, we're not seeing anything. Should we be seeing something? Oh, oh no. Yes, I'm so sorry. Um, Am I not sharing my screen? But you can share it now. Okay. So, let's see. Okay, what are y'all seeing now? Are you seeing anything Gorgeousness. now? Gorgeousness. Yeah, we can see it now. 
Oh, I am so sorry. I have this That's wonderful okay. presentation and you can't maybe, see anything. Um, maybe you could link you it going. in the comments for everybody to see. Okay. Um, I will very quickly just kind of show you some of these things. Um, these are gorgeous images of UNT <laughs> um, and some of our other archival holdings. Uh, and fortunately, this commentary about uh, Red Sonia Rogatino. The only thing I want to point out real quick is there is the artist conception there of what the original Red Sonia looked like. And then this is how she looked in Marvel Comics when she first appeared in 1973. And then, of course, you guys have to see these 1970s babes in the chain mail or in the metal bikinis because that was all over the 1970s female art. And that definitely is part of where Sonia got her image. So um, I, I deeply apologize that y'all missed the first ones. And uh, thank you definitely for letting me know because I would not want you to miss these unusual images. But anyway, in the interest of time, uh, let's move on. So basically Roy Thomas was saying, hey, Conan's in a loincloth, let's put Sonia in a bikini. Sonia made the jump from the printed page to the movies. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with the controversial Red Sonia film with Brigitte Nielsen. Brigitte, unfortunately, even though she plays the main character, she gets overshadowed by Arnold there. Alas, we did not get this 2009 film, but we got some beautiful artwork. But fans definitely still have the hope of getting um, a Red Sonia movie. The trailer for the Red Sonia with Matilda Lutz was actually debuted at this year's Comic Con, but it's coming soon. And we don't know when that coming soon is, hopefully someday soon. All right, so how do fans react to Sonya? This was a real surprise to Marvel execs. She was embraced out of all proportion to her media presence or to the character's commercial value. Um, she was actually surprisingly popular among women fans. In fact, Sonya was one of the biggest hits with what we would now think of as cosplayers. She showed up at several conventions in fact, in 1976, there was a convention dedicated entirely to Sonia in New Jersey that was even covered by the New York Times. According to one podcaster, cosplaying Red Sonia in the 1970s was as popular as cosplaying Harley Quinn is now. So the popular wisdom is that Sonia just got the makeover and the chainmail bikini to appear to the male gaze, the male comic book reader. But is something else going on here? Let's dig into why Sonya is so popular with women. Okay. So was the rebrand that straightforward? Sonya herself hasn't really actually talked about much of the rebranding in her history and in the comics. She has once said, if they're looking at my body, they're not looking at my sword as a distraction. What are some of the things that we can learn from fandom's reaction to Red Sonya? Um, Sonya leaves us with a lot of questions and not a lot of answers, a lot of things to look into. What does it mean that this portrayal in the chainmail bikini persists, even though fandom and authorship is becoming increasingly female? For example, one of Sonia's most successful runs was written by Gail Simone, who has taken on several other strong female characters. Uh, one of her most famous is her writing of Wonder Woman. Why is this conception of Sonia embraced by so many female fans? And one of the biggest questions are there any terms under which this Sonia can be defined as feminist? Okay. So a couple of thoughts here on Red Sonia. Uh, this popular image of her in the chainmail bikini has become so overwhelming that it has even reached back to cross pollinate with the original Red Sonia of Rogatino story, The Shadow of the Vulture. Uh, we see from this Kindle edition, they put very much Marvel Sonia on the cover even though Marvel Sonia has nothing to do with Howard's conception. Howard's Red Sonia is a lot more of the conception of what second wave feminism might see as a strong woman. She is definitely a fierce and independent fighter, but she is very critical of the sexual availability of other women. Uh, she even uses such strong language like hussy to describe a woman that she considers loose. Marvel Sonia has more aspects of third wave feminism. Sonia is a very potty positive character, body positive enough to rock that chain male bikini, but she enforces her own boundaries by force if necessary. 
Now, many people are rightly very, very horrified by Sonia's backstory. It is traumatic. But in the era of Me Too, there are some aspects of it that are all too resonant with some fans. In many ways, it becomes a story of revenge and with wish fulfillment aspects, and more importantly, reclaiming agency after a horrible violation. There are many in modern fandom who see Sonia, chain male bikini and all, as a symbol of both strength and sexual choice. But regardless, the chain male bikini is probably here to stay, good or ill. So where do we go from here? Uh, well, gender, especially the female gender, is something that has been understudied in the classic cults. I would recommend looking into Howard Sonia. Is she representative? Is she an outlier? Are there other interesting characters like her to look at? Why did Roy Thomas select Sonia rather than one of Howard's other heroines? Uh, Marvel Sonia is arguably a lot closer to Howard's character Valeria than Red Sonia of Rogatino. Oh, thank you so much. I'm sorry. We're going to have to stop here to make sure oh. everybody gets enough time. But very cool. I'm so sorry. It happens. Okay. So next we have Hale Lamb. Take it away, Hale. Hi. Um, let me share my screen. Um... All right. Hi, y'all. Um, thanks for having me. Um, so much has been written about how Lingma Severance. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'm an English English uh, PhD student at the George Washington University. Apologies. <laughs> um, but this is the title of my paper, uh, Ghosts in the Machine, Technospectral Femininity in Lingma Severance. Um, Okay, <laughs> so much has been written about um, how Lingma Severance, published in 2018, accurately depicts the trajectories of the COVID-19 pandemic under neoliberal capitalism in this work of fiction about a zombifying plague called Shen Fever. Um, less has been studied about the ways Candace figures as a hybrid ghost and machine. Uh, so through her virtual persona, New York Ghost, um, Candace photographs the city impelled different parts of the deserted New York by an online audience who cannot see or detect her bodily presence. I argue that in her decision to stay, work, and describe what she witnesses in the abandoned and decaying city, Candace enacts a way of looking that recalls the inapprehensible yet always producing figure of the yellow woman as spectator. Ma's female Asian American protagonist and her ghostly photographic persona presents a site for theorizing about ontological Asiatic femininity as that which creates narrative and visual temporal disjointedness, as well as a bit of spectatorship embodied and enacted by Candace. The zombies referred to as the fevered um, in Lingma Severance do not eat flesh, nor do they turn people into zombies. Instead, they continue to do what they were doing before they became zombies, um, again and again until they die. The protagonist Candace Chen joined a group of eight unfevered quote unquote, brand strategists and property lawyers and human resources specialists and personal finance consultants, end quote, as they make their way to the facility, a mall partially owned by the former IT worker, Bob, the leader of the group. The novel itself presents a narrative, temporal and spatial disjointedness as it jumps around Candace's life before and after Shen Fever and the world, from her life back in Fuzhou to Utah, to New York, to Chicago. In New York City, she works as a Bible manufacturing coordinator for Spectra, managing the overseas production of Bibles in Shenzhen, China. All right. So, quote, I don't know why someone would stay as long as Candace. Candace overhears one of the group members discuss what compelled her to remain in New York long after the city has become, according to them, uninhabitable. They refer to her photographic alias, New York Ghost, as proof of its uninhabitability. Quote, in those New York fo ghost photos, if I'm remembering right, the city did not look habitable. It looked almost empty. In this moment, she chooses to not reveal herself to the group as New York Ghost. The photos of New York Ghost are, at the same time, proof of presence. Someone must have taken these photos. And proof of absence. There are a lack of people in these photos. Candace's merging with the camera fuses together two forms. 
the ghost and the machine. I draw on Derrida's ontology to think through this mode of spectating, and he wrote, writes, this thing, meanwhile, looks at us and sees us not at, um, sees us not see it even when it is there. A spectral asymmetry interrupts here all specularity. It desynchronizes, it recalls us to anachrony. We will call this the visor effect. We do not see who looks at us. So Candace's refusal to come forth as your ghost enacts a ghostly mode of spectating in which it is Candace's own body that acts as a visor blocking the group's recognition of her ghostly form. As the year goes, Candace describes her role as spectator. Quote, readers wrote in asking for pictures and dispatches from their old neighborhoods, their friends' apartments, nostalgic sites. New York ghost complied. As a mix between a machine, the camera, and ghost, Candace's spectatorship is productive, taking a picture mixed to immaterial material. And through the internet, people are able to call or conjure the New York ghost and enact a kind of returning to places through Candace. So this merging is possible because of the blurred boundary between object and personhood of the yellow woman. As N. Chang through documents um, and theorizes about in her foundational work ornamentalism, um, in studying the yellow woman who serve as the ghostly predecessors of cyborgs in movies like Ex Machina and Ghost in the Shell, Chang writes, quote, what is inside the machine, the yellow woman and the ghost within the ghost, end quote. This racialized gendering of the Asian woman is what I argue sets the stage for the enmeshment of ghost, machine, and person. The figure of the ghost in Asian American literary traditions, which Jana Odabas traces to the woman warrior in the ghost within, serves as a cultural orientation point. They refer to concrete historical sites, they reference certain ghost beliefs, but they also trouble neat categorizations as they highlight the hauntedness of any conceptualization. Um, end quote. Candace, suffering the loss of both her parents by her mid-twenties, is haunted by memories of them and simultaneously a life that could have been if she had never been brought to the United States. Candace captures the in-betweenness and out of places of diasporic Asians. Candace, as ghosts, sees and experiences time differently. And in one moment, when looking outside from her office window at the empty streets of Times Square, she recalls, merges, or maybe confuses the past, present, and future of the landscape. Her imagination becomes thoroughly enmeshed with her camera or her gaze, or maybe her gaze suddenly acquires the capacities of the camera. And she states, looking at the windows, I imagine the future as a time-lapse video spanning the years it takes for Times Square to be overrun by ghetto palms, wetland vegetation, and wildlife. Or maybe I was actually conjuring up the past, the pine and hickory forest island that the Dutch first glimpsed upon arriving, populated with black bears and wolves, Foxes and weasels, bobcats and mountain lions, ducks and geese in every stream. Initial Can I interrupt you for a second? Are you meant to be clicking through your slides? I am. <gasps> oh no. Okay. <gasps> I'm so sorry. <laughs> Is that, is that right? Perfect, thank you. All right, okay. Um, okay. Um, initial European explorers have viewed Manhattan as paradise. Here, I would lead a horse to drink. There, I'd build a fire. And there still, I would see a refuge from the sun and rest in the shade. Time-lapse videos make more visually obvious the effects of time by speeding it up or bringing events in closer proximity to each other. In this moment, Candace imagines all these moments in time as overlapping or collapsing on top of each other. She takes up temporarily inhabiting or possessing the perspective of Europeans who arrive. Her use of the eye as she claims the area as a site for her to act, taking up their settler colonial rendering of the land as malleable paradise for them to make home. This stepping into the European settler colonial perspective isn't so much an adoption of their imperatives. Instead, through her ghostly perspective, Candace traces the ruination of New York back to the Dutch settlement and the ways they reshape the landscape. Yet, Candace isn't just tracing. In this act of spectating, she narrates an alternative explanation for what is happening. In Mark Fisher's essay, What is Hauntology? He writes, haunting can be seen as intrinsically resistant to the contraction and homogenization of time and space. It happens when a place is stained by time or when a particular place becomes the site for an encounter with broken time, end quote. New York, uninhabitable due to a pandemic born out of capitalist globalization and uh, through Candace's haunting presence, becomes a site for time to adopt new directions. The use of, again, I by Candace means that it is actively, she's actively doing the conjuring of the past. 
Then suddenly Candace hears, then sees a horse who used to pull carriages um, in Central Park, gallivanting through Times Square with no carriage. Candace's impulse to begin posting after many years on her photography blog comes from a desire to marvel at the spectacle with others. She captions her first photo, if New York is breaking down, no one documents it. Is it actually happening? Her caption emphasizes not human senses, um, but memory that can be shared. She contests whether the event even takes place if it, it is not documented. And the use of quote unquote, no one could also refer back to Candace herself as no one putting into question her own presence. It is here that Candace most prominently embodies a hybrid form of ghost and machine. And Fisher writes, the specter cannot be fully present um, it has no being in itself and marks a relation to what it is no longer or not yet. Um, Candace, as an am amalgamation of specter camera and person, doesn't just mark herself in relation, but actively produces this breaking of time. When Candace returns to posting on New York Ghost, she also begins navigating the city in different ways. It, it is the first time she knows that she stops living in the myth of New York and comes to know and love the thing itself. End quote. No longer wandering aimlessly around New York, taking pictures from an outsider's perspective, she is motivated by the memories of those who, lived, who used to live in New York. This is similar to how her mother, Wu Fang, incorporates memories from other people and weaves them into her own. In a flashback to Candace at her mother's bedside, Wu Fang begins recounting her husband's memories as if they were her own. Candace remembers things. Um, it was as if she had absorbed her husband's memories as her own, or maybe she was trying to speak for him to keep his memories in circulation, end quote. Riefing enmeshes herself with her dead husband by absorbing, whether intentionally or not, his memories, which is a ghostly act. Both Candace and Rufing do not try to hold onto clear boundaries of the self. And we see the ways Candace and Rufing's tendency to lose themselves wherever they are can be incredibly destructive. Her parents move to the United States and need to save enough money before they bring Candace over. And when Candace finally does arrive, she observes a change in her mother. Quote, in this new country, she was disciplinary and restrictive, prone to angry outbursts, easily frustrated so fascist with arbitrary rules that struck me even as a six-year-old as unreasonable. The way Rufing has had to negotiate navigating the new country has led to a change in character and a new disciplinary relationship with her daughter. There's a sense of melancholia um, when Candace describes the difference between her mother and Fujo in Utah. Ma does not present an all-encompassing solution for how to inhabit environments or relate to others, and the novel ends as ambiguously. Candace flees to Chicago with plans to raise her baby. And she experiences a, quote, secondhand familiarity upon entering the city, as if all the stories of Jonathan, her former, her ex-boyfriend, um, told of his years in Chicago while we lay drowsing in bed has seeped into my own memories. She reenacts Riefeng's absorption of her husband's memory, memories, keeping Jonathan's memories in circulation and therefore in her child's life. Yet unlike Rufang, those memories do not override Candace's own. Instead, as she ventures further into Chicago, her own memories of visiting the city with her mother are unlocked. And during this trip, Candace and Rufang envision a different future with just the two of them. As Candace envisions what living in her mother's alternate life would be like, she still maps out a world so centered around and supportive of the violent capitalist structures that shape a city. She thinks, as she's uh, uh, walking through, uh, driving through Chicago, to live in a city is to take part in and to propagate its impossible systems, to wake up, to go to work in the morning. It is also to take pleasure in these systems because otherwise who could repeat the same routines year in and year out? At the same time, Candace drives through an empty Chicago, maneuvering around abandoned cars at a standstill because there's no one left to drive them. There are no longer any people to uphold the city's impossible systems. And in choosing to inhabit Chicago, Candace haunts a new and familiar city. What would it mean for an Asian American ghost and machine to enmesh herself with a city? As Candace's car comes to a grinding, grinding to a halt, she sees the skyline, an infinite horizon, and the novel ends with her walking toward it. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. So we did really well. I mean, even with whatever technical difficulties, we still have 11 minutes left for questions. So if anybody would like to ask some questions, please put it in the Q&A. Um, we do have one already. This is for, um, it says for Ms. Jenneret. Are you ready? Okay. My, this is from Jacob Adler, my familiarity with the Mass Effect series is somewhat limited, but do the games at all examine how the definition of human gender slash sexuality might develop in comparison to its numerous alien species, which presumably have physical and cultural gender sexuality constructs differing vastly from that of humanity? 
Yeah, so um, <clears throat> particularly interesting in Mass Effect is the Asari species, which is a monogendered species. Um, broadly, I would say that the conceptualizations of gender are presented through a very, uh, a very Western humanistic sort of lens of like a gender binary that persists across most uh, species presented in the games. Um, but the Asari are a monogendered species that culturally treats all of their uh, members as female. Um, and what this does rhetorically is very interesting. And the game, I don't think, has a chance to really dive into that too much specifically, but it does have, uh, it does nod towards that by sort of discussing the role of fatherhood in that kind of uh, relationship dynamic, particularly it takes this idea of fatherhood and strips it of gendered implications, where for an Asari child, a father is the non-childbearing parent. Um, and I think just the limitations, the the strengths and the limitations of the of those games are clear in that example, in that the games do try to push for some interesting explorations of gender, interesting explorations of sexuality and relationships, but they are constrained by their mainstream uh, blockbustery kind of appeal to try and hone in as much of a as much of a broad audience as possible. So there's a lot of conversation to be had, even where Mass Effect doesn't uh, necessarily take that up directly. Thanks, Kimberly. Um, I have another question uh from ben great papers all to kimberly and josie your papers do a super job of zeroing in diverse representations of queer people in games i'm curious how do mechanics like how i physically interact with the game fold into or maybe not into your thinking Well, as mentioned, there is a lot of character customization in the game. Unfortunately, you don't really get to see your character once you've customized him, her, or them, um, unless you are, say, in a bathroom or some other place where there's a mirror and you can see the character's face. Uh, having not come out as trans when I began my first playthrough, I didn't initially make a character that looked like me. My second playthrough, which I'm just at the very beginning of, I haven't even finished the first major story mission, uh, I, I chose a character that was a feminine avatar of myself, and I've already noticed that there's a, um, there, there's a tendency to try and play the game as a sort of fashion simulator, and... Um, it's it's definitely something that adds to the game's replayability value. The fact that uh, if you can create a character that represents the avatar of yourself, or someone who you think you might be, or someone who interests you, for instance, if you chose to make an avatar of a celebrity or a meme character, then there is a replayability, replayability value to play the game as an avataristic portrayal of your uh, gendered other avatar or your true gender avatar or a uh, celebrity or a mimetic avatar. Excellent. Um, I Let's see, what, what do we have? Yeah, more room for expression. I agree, Elizabeth. I have a question for both Jessica and Hale. I'll say them at the same time so that everybody has some time to answer. So Jessica, what I wanted to ask you, because as soon as I saw those pictures, I was thinking of Grace Jones from Conan, right? So I wanted mm -hmm. to know if you could talk a little bit about that representation. And for Hale, your question that I have for you is, I love this idea of, um, I love this idea of ghosts. However, um, what about the image, like when Candace's mother appears to her at the end and she's like, get out of here, run, go now. Um, that's an interesting moment as well. 
I'm sorry to cut in just before you um, anyone answers. We are actually scheduled to move to the next paper session, but I would like to give you a, a, a few moments to just answer that question before we move on. Sorry. <laughs> Well, my answer will be very short. Unfortunately, it has been a long time since I've seen that, uh, the one with Grace Jones. I will say it is very interesting that Sonia is presented in much more classically beautiful terms, whereas the Grace Jones character, you know, the short hair and things like that um, is presented less, sorry, um, less so. Um, she is definitely presented um, as less of the classical ideal, but yet she also has her own agency. She's a strong character. She can fight very well. I think that Grace Jones and Red Sonia would get along very well. I think they would have a lot in common. And Hale, you want to quickly respond? Yeah, um, ghosts and like generational memory. Um, I think that that's what you're picking up on that I really would love to sit more with. But yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Uh, and yeah, thank, you. thank you. Just again, give me a few moments to swap everyone over for the next session. You guys were amazing. <laughs>